everyone. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank Richard uh, for inviting me to this uh, this uh, PGA uh, symposium through a series of emails we have uh, shared over the last few months. Um, he must have thought my, my work was was uh, was worth uh, uh, coming here to present. I also would like to thank him for. Um, uh, allowing me to have the opportunity to be a panelist on the uh, Tuesday's forum about how to help uncover the primordial nonlinear multiple dimensional quantum engine that underpins the extant causal wheel work of nature, which is uh, an enterprise I think almost all of us are engaged, engaged in. Okay? Knowing what went down yesterday, I don't, don't know how much we accomplished, but <laughs> but anyway, I was I was uh, uh, pleased to have participated in that. Now, historically, the aim of science has been to determine the hows or why the world works. This is the prevailing worldview. The questions related to the whys of existence have been deemed to be not the province of science, but totally outside the scientific di disciplines or method, and basically relegated to solely as a subject matter of psychology and the various worlds, religions, or, or spiritual disciplines. Hopefully, the upshot of this conference will be to conflate this artificial imposed divide with the ultimate realization that the current paradigms indeed need to be changed, not only in terms of the specific theories of how the world works, but also in terms of the way in which scientific discovery is, uh, is currently practiced. And I know this is a subject near and dear to uh, Charles Lucas's heart. He's not here this morning. Oh, yes? Okay. In this regard, I come to this conference you know, primarily as a student in these matters. To learn, as I share with all of you, all your ideas, and help forge the development of a more expansive understanding of reality. And it's in this spirit uh, that I'd like to share with you the results of my, my research. I also, in this regard, I also would like to emphasize that none of the information I'm about to share with you is, is original work. Okay? Much of the uh, instead, having culled and distilled much of the best of this research by others, I'm acting kind of like a messenger in this capacity to make more technically astute individuals such as yourselves uh, aware of the unsung merits of this particular theory and how it, along with other paradigms like the zero totality model, can be implemented in helping to explain uh, some of the mysteries and anomalies currently extant in physics. And in this regard, I feel I have, I have to issue uh, somewhat of a disclaimer. I, I, in no way, do I consider myself an expert in this subject. Uh, so if my presentation is lacking in knowledgeability and may appear incomplete or sketchy, please remember, I'm only a messenger. <laughs> This particular theory has been around for a long time, but for some reason hasn't been accepted by mainstream physics. I speak of the 1941 Stuckelberg Manif Manifestly Covariant Off-Mass Shell Model of Physical Interaction. However, since the follow-up refinement work by Horowitz, Perron, and others dating from the 1970s, there have been developed compelling reasons that could raise the respectability of this particular theory in the eyes of Main Street science, and I hope to show you some of those reasons. First, what is meant by off-mass shell dynamics, for those who aren't familiar with this subject? Let's compare the standard on-mass shell signature from that of the off-mass shell variety. As we can see here, the basic difference lies in the kinematical equation describing the interaction of particles 
showing that in the conventional theory uh, to the right, mass is constant. Making energy and momentum, whoops, making energy and momentum dependent on each other. Whereas in the off-mass shell model to the right, mass is now a, a, considered a dynamical quantity, making the energy and momentum independent. Mutually independent. Now, for math mathematical and physical reasons, Stuckelberg showed that both the standard on mass non relativistic and relativistic quantum field equations, those governed by the relationship on your left, were insufficient to properly describe certain phenomena. Now, the dynamic nature of mass in the off-shell formalism also necessitates a dual role for time. And this is one of the key, key elements of this, uh, of this model. Time in the on-shell model, to your left, of quantum mechanics, is usually viewed as a scalar parameter describing the evolution of the wave function. As such, for physical and mathematical reasons, time in the on-shell formalism can't be assigned observable status and can't be associated with an operator, unlike position and momentum. However, in the off-mass shell theory, where mass is viewed as a dynamical variable, the one information on the left in the previous side, time can now be elevated to full operator status. A new scalar parameter, tau, oops, new scalar parameter, tau, describes the evolution of the wave function and is an invariant, is an invariant global universal time that, which has causal meaning. So we, we incorporate this, this new scalar parameter describing the evolution of the wave function. It's an invariant global universal time, as I said, having causal uh, meaning, where now T, elevated to observable status, is now a quantum operator and it transforms covariant. covariant. Most importantly, this means that the off-shell system admits quantum superposition, superposition of states in the whole four-dimensional picture, where now time in this model acts as another spatial dimension, and therefore events can move forward or backward in time t. One interesting consequence of this model is a purely classical <coughs> interpretation of pair production and correlation. <coughs> also, this time symmetry, sy symmetric quantum mechanics, which is fundamentally similar to John Kramer's transactional interpretation, interpretation of quantum mechanics, and is, all, is also a central feature of Richard's holographic anthropic multiverse theory, as we have found out in the last few days. Now, how can we practically use this new format, this Stuckelberg manifestly uh, covariant quantum theory, to provide ourselves with new predictions and to explain already uh, extant phenomena in physics? Indeed, off-mass shell, shell dynamics may possibly play a key role in room temperature energetic phenomena particularly those exhibiting documented persistent unexplained anomalies that have been unable to be produced on demand. And I'm sure one of 
The most controversial of these is the low energy nuclear reaction, or as it's called, LENAR, which was originally uh, termed cold fusion. It's not necessary to recount the sad sag saga of the Pons Fleshman uh, debacle. Uh, however, suffice it to say that over the two or more decades since this phenomenon surface, continued research has shown unquestionable, unquestionably that low energy nuclear reactions are genuine and that accompanying excess energy and power gain and commensurate alpha particle production and minimal neutron production are undeniable. Heralding an important new complete form of energy production enabled by highly loaded metal hydrides. Now, the standard branching ratios for orthodox plasma fusing, fusion are given by the following reaction channels. Okay, here Q, Q is the kinetic energy released by the reaction in the center of mass Lorentz frame. However, using this model, the standard calculation for the penetration factor through the Coulomb barrier at room temperature gives reaction rates that are 50 orders of magnitude smaller than the claimed empirical results of Pons and Fleshman. Also, it was calculated that the required electron mass for this to be a genuine reaction at room temperature would have to be 10 times the ordinary rest mass in order for the tunneling rate and a deuterium molecule to explain the Pons Fleshman results for excess heat. This situation obviously has prevented the development of a coherent theoretical model to satisfactorily explain these effects that could be used as a guide in carrying out new experimental tests to sort out the essential parameters uh, and controls needed to achieve the requisite rep rep reproducibility on demand. Nevertheless, although the mass of elementary particles in a bound stationary state are, by current paradigms, uh, assumed to be constant, the required increase in electron mass for the viability of the Lenner scenario alluded to above caused physicist Mark Davidson, and if you want this reference, I can give it to you privately because privately, I had forgotten to... Uh, included on my slide presentation because I was uh, trying to hurriedly get this ready for for presentation. To consider such off-mass shell dynamics as a possible actual occurrence within, which would then explain, unlike any previous ideas advanced, the effectiveness for all of the Anomalous empirical effects documented in association with Leonard. Here's the scenario that Davidson speculates for off mass shell enabled nuclear reaction. Consider two neighboring deuterons in a palladium lattice. The masses of the deuterons and possibly the nearby electrons, too, are now moving off the mass shell slowly off the mass shell, due to the interaction with the condensed matter system. Now, according to off the off-mass shell theory, we further assume that the final state masses in the fusion process are the usual rest masses of the particle. Uh, that's, and also that special conditions inside the solid are required for anomalous Lenner effects to occur. Finally, we assume that after a certain period of time, the system returns to normal and that all masses return to their rest mass values, except for those that have experienced a nuclear reaction. Now, it's a proposed here that an active deuteron pair will re re reduces its mass slowly until it is approximately equal to the mass of an alpha particle. Although this is a radical assumption, which has never been observed in nature, it could be possible, therefore, if an off-mass shell effective Lagrangian were to describe a small volume of the lattice, uh, tunneling would be enhanced, 
by the increase in the electron mass, and the decrease of the deuterium mass would allow resonant tunneling directly into an alpha particle. And as a bonus, we would have suppression of neutrons and, and tritium. Therefore, off-mass shell enabled fusion depends on two tuning parameters. The mean deuteron mass and the mean electron mass. And you can see this uh, represented in this diagram. You have, you have the deuteron mass over a period of time decreasing and the electron mass over time increasing until there's a resonance at this point here where, uh, where you would have the, uh, the, the transformation into an alpha particle. Notice how the, uh, the channel for the reactions of neutrons drops off, the, the probability for that uh, possibility drops off as well as tritium for well before we reach residence. The figure illustrates these ideas qualitatively. We see that in the main fusion, main fusion is occurring. At the instant, the combined deuteron masses equal the mass of an alpha particle. But this is not when most of the heat will be added to the solid because the Q value that we showed earlier for fusion is essentially zero then since the masses of the two deuterons sum to a very nearly the mass of an alpha particle at resonance. The energy has been given up due to, up to the condensed matter previous, prior to fusion due to the continuously varying masses and transients continue until all masses return to their on-shell values. Davidson speculizes that this relaxation process might result in a parent heat production after all the driving factors such as electrolysis have ceased. And this, by the way, could explain the so-called life after death phenomenon that is, has been observed as attendant with the uh, cold fusion phenomenon, which some of you are uh, knowledgeable of. Now, assuming this theory is correct, then we can make a very simple experimental prediction that is testable. It is expected here that the Q values for the reactions in A, B, and C will be observed to decrease with time as the loading factor, and that is the ratio of the deuterium to the palladium, uh, increases in systems that exhibit excess heat production. Such a reduction in the Q values for a fundamental nuclear reaction, however, had never been observed before. But if this happened, it would be a clear and undeniable proof that the Duran mass was changing in these settings. Indeed, if these if theoretical speculations are confirmed empirically, it could, would have elevate the uh, Stuckelberg off-mass shell theory to definitely a greater level of respectability in the eyes of mainstream uh, physics community. In this regard, think of this. If this is true, post uh, cold fusion could be viewed as the poster child for the off-mass shell subatomic reactions. Even more potential paradigm-shifting revolutions might be in the offing using the Stuckelberg modification of the standard Schrodinger equation, in particular, there possibly might arise new physics regarding the prediction of possible repulsive gravitational behavior within a black hole. Again, something that is, uh, un would be unprecedented. Deriving from the off-mass shell model is a generalized Lorentz force containing a term which drives the particles off-shell. This implies new field strengths called premaxwell fields, which I'm not, I don't have enough time to go into, and a fifth electromagnetic potential 
and a corresponding gauge field which has as its source the matter density. So your, your new fifth uh, field strength corresponds to the matter density. Now this motivates investigation into the connection between the dynamical equations of the off-mass shell theory and gravitation. Here we find in the off-mass shell theory the Hamiltonian dynamics of three-dimensional space is replaced by the four-dimensional Minkowski space leading to a five-dimensional uh, wave, wave equations for the associated gauge functions. And that's due to the twofold nature of time that we've just talked about a couple of slides ago. And the extra degree of freedom introduced in the, into this system alluded to above. Now, employing the metric tensor in kinematical terms of the stuckelberg schrodinger equation, it turns out that one can obtain classical general relativity in an iconal approximation. Now, for those who are not familiar with it, an iconal equation is, is a nonlinear equation uh, since it is represented by sums of squares of first order, first order differentials. Now, since the iconal approximation lowers the dimension of the differential equations describing the fields by one, the iconal approximation to the five-dimensional Stuckelberg equation in a curved space-time character characterized by metric tensor will result in standard four-dimensional Einstein geodesic on a curved manifold. General relativity, then, might appear as an emergent phenomenon or as an approximation to a more basic nonlinear quantum iconal equation. The results of applying a quantum iconal format, format in, a, in a Schwarzschild gravitational context is most revealing, since it shows that general relativity may be incomplete and even inaccurate in connection with effects surrounding uh, gravitational collapse. I'm about to demonstrate this to you now. We start with the Stokelberg Schrodinger equation, given in this form. Notice now we're taking derivative with respect to this new uh, second time, tau, which is the, uh, the continuous variable, uh, whereas the standard time is observed as quantum, uh, quantum observable associated with a, uh, an operator. In the iconal approximation, we assume this wave question, equation. So, such that, if we input it into our first equation, which is this one, we end up with this, uh, this wave equation. Which, if we In, input this in, in terms of the Schwarzschild uh, metric becomes this wave function you see here. Now, for the Schwarzschild metric, considering the purely radial case, after substituting the metric into the first equation and separating variables, we have the following wave equation. And separating variables, we have the following, this following wave equation. I think, yeah, one slide. Where k, or kappa, equals 2mk, where m is the capital M, has dimensions of mass squared and equals the uh, standard mass squared on the particle's mass shell. Substituting this form into the first equation, we get for R for the far gravitational field. We take where R is much greater than 2M, with M being a capital M, and therefore neglect higher orders of 2M over R 
after substituting kappa equals m squared, the radial equation has the form oops, that you see here. The effective central potential for this function will have the form which is given in this equation here. And we notice that the effective gravitational mass is altered by this small extra term. And moving back to ordinary units, the effective gravitational mass is this equation here. <clears throat> the solution for R gives us a Bessel function. We have Bessel functions of the first and second, uh, the second kind in this solution for R. And the study of the predictions close and within black hole horizon, we take This transformation of variables, we now transform from the variable, capital R, to the variable B with this, this equation right here. And we get another Schrodinger-like equation oops, in the new variable BR. Expanding the potential around R approaching the the event horizon, which would be at two times the capital M, uh, and we're approaching from the outside, the potential in this equation would take the form that you see here, where this D now is equal to, as you can see, R minus 2M over 2M as it approaches, as it approaches zero. Solving the radial equation in this region, we obtain from the dominant parts, finding the expectation value now as R approaches the value at the event horizon. This is the formula for the expectation, expectation value of that uh, variable equation R. And changing where lambda is the uncertainty and location of the particle on the R axis, we get the following. As we change variables around the horizon, now we get for the expect expectation value this formula. And notice how we see from this result the fact that the particle is very strongly captured by the horizon, by your event horizon, because the expectational value of R, as you're approaching the uh, event horizon from the outside, is 2M, which would be its value at the horizon. So we can see from this result is the fact that the particle is very strongly captured uh, by the horizon itself. Now, the radial, uh, taking the same potential and solving the radial equation for R approaching your event horizon value from the inside, we have this, uh, this equation for our solution for R, where we D now, it's the uh, one minus the other D, as we uh, studied as the uh, object approached the horizon from the outside. Finding the expectation value, again, of R and changing the variables around the horizon, we get this. It can be seen that within a small distance from that horizon, the expectation value terms move towards R equals 2M. So, 
And the reason that the interacting particle behaves different quantum mechanically within the event horizon or around the event horizon than is expected classically through general relativity is the fact that the expectation value takes quantum interference into account. This result means that effectively a particle that is at the horizon will most probably stay at the horizon and not fall into the center. This can be more clearly seen in the, in the three-dimensional numerical graphical solution to the potential equation. As you can see, your probability density function for the object appearing, uh, the amplitude decays as you approach the center of the black hole. And most likely the particle will appear very close to the event horizon. It sh this shows the evolution of the wave function in the interior region of the black hole, as I said, where distance from the center of the black hole is between zero to m. Now because of the symmetry of the boundary conditions around uh, t equals zero, the function separates into two wave functions. And you can see this represented here you have two wave functions after you pass the, uh, the, the confines of the event horizon. We have one property propagating in the t direction, and this is more clearly shown here, one propagating in the t direction and the other propagating in the minus t direction as r. Consequently, the quantum model, based on the stuckelberg schrodinger equation, definitely suggests new physics regarding the prediction of the repulsive gravitational behavior within the black hole. Indeed, if this is remarkable effect is shown to be genuine, it would be, have profounding repercussions that would shake the current edifice of fundamental physics to its very core. So in conclusion here, as it's well known, it's generally regarded that all aspects of gravitational effects can be codified by Einsteinian general relativity. However, the above potentially earth-shaking results are quite compelling evidence revealing that the general relativity, uh, general relativity may not be the only game in time. Moreover, since the manifestly covariant Stokelberg theory requires a new worldview in connection with the temporal aspects of reality. That's the twofold nature of time that we've introduced. Perhaps this is a hint leading us to the inevitable truth that gravitation may actually be more related to time than mass. Now think about that. Moreover, on a grander panoramic scale, our expanding, expanding knowledge gleaned from the examination of the Stokelberg formalism as applied to areas of investigation such as cold fusion, uh, gravitation, or other field effects will certainly explicitly shape the future of society as well as science, especially concerning our openness to phenomena that challenge our current belief systems. And with that, I thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Don? Once upon a time, many, many years ago, I played around with that. Oh, did you? Yeah. Uh, before I read Stuckelberg, who, who, who is a character of oh, yeah. interest. Oh, yes. He's but a kind of class to the highest degree. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, uh, at the time, uh, what bugged me was uh, the difference in the meaning between T and tau. It looked to me like tau was the conjugate to the Hamiltonian and therefore you wouldn't be able to really interpret it as time any longer. It would be sort of like an increment in, what's the word I'm looking for? In, 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 uh, no, the in, uh, in a computer yeah, simulation. Evolution, evolution computer the simulation. wave function? Yeah, no, yeah. What? It, well, it's in the yeah. wave function, right, but it's a, it's a, it's a parameter, yeah, parameter that Scale. advances the ca calculation of the wave function. Yes. Whereas the T, right. not the top of the T, would have to be uh, associated with events. And so uh, they lose the meaning that it had, the T loses the meaning altogether that it has in, in standard quantum mechanics, and that's transferred to the tau. 
uh, and so I saw it. Yeah. And uh, uh, after you stare at that for a while, you there's a big uh, there's a lot of possibilities, but I never did resolve in my own head exactly what T is. You know, are the T's the time of the arrival of a, an electromagnetic interaction, or the departure of an electromagnet, or what? Right. But m since most problems in physics are single particles bathed in external fields, I would guess that the that the T's would wind up being the arrival times of signals from the external <coughs> excuse me, field. And uh, did you Whether get from your sense. studies that now the time is elevated to at observable status? Well. And uh, associated with, a, yeah. with an operator? Yeah, that. And it can be integrated that, in there in, in that fashion, yeah. in a consistent mathematical yeah. Yeah, way, yeah, which, yeah. which current quantum mechanics. It's undo, really. You can't have a time operator. <laughs> Produce but, contradictions but and that all would mean it's subject problems. to uncertainty, and that could be an uncertainty due to lack of knowledge or yeah. anything. Yeah. Since we don't know what it is in quantum mechanics to begin with. Anybody else? Let's give Al another round.